Welcome to Story Station, episode 22. In this episode, you can listen to three Japanese stories. The first story is titled, The Two Daughters. These two daughters cared very deeply about their father, and they taught him a very important lesson. The second story is titled, The Chrysanthemum Show. Listen to this striking story about a fairground and the amazing chrysanthemum show. The third story is titled, The Filial Girl. This girl's devotion to her mother could not be faced by anything, not even a tragic ordeal. Hope you enjoy it! I will read a story called The Two Daughters. At Akita, in the province of Inaba, lived an independent gentleman who had two daughters, by whom he was ministered to with all filial piety. He was fond of shooting with a gun, though, and thus very often committed the sin of taking life. He would never hearken to the admissions of his daughters. These, mindful of the future, and aghast at the prospect in store for him in the world to come, frequently endeavored to convert him. Many were the tears they shed. At last, one day, after they had pleaded with him more earnestly still than before, the father, touched by their supplications, promised to shoot no more. But after a while, some of his neighbors came round to request him to shoot for them, two storks. He was easily led to consent by the strength of his natural liking for the sport. Still, he would not allow a word to be breathed to his daughters. He slipped out at night, gun in hand, after they were, as he imagined, fast asleep. They, however, had heard everything, and the elder sister said to the younger one, Do what we may, our father will not condescend to follow our words of counsel, and nothing now remains but to bring him to a knowledge of the truth by the sacrifice of one of our own lives. Tonight is fortunately moonless, and if I put on white garments and go to the neighborhood of the bay, he will take me for a stork and shoot me dead. Do you continue to live and tend to our father with all the services of filial piety? Thus she spoke, her eyes dimmed with the rolling tears. But the younger sister, with many sobs, exclaimed, For you, my sister, for you it is to receive the inheritance of this house. So do you condescend to be the one to live, and practice filial devotion to our father, while I offer up my life? Thus did each strive for death. The elder one, without more words, seizing a white garment, rushed out of the house. The younger one, unwilling to cede her to the place of honor, putting on a white gown also, followed her in her track to the shore of the bay. They are making her way among the rushes. She continued the dispute as to which of the two should be the one to die. Meanwhile, the father, peering around him in the darkness, saw something white. Taking it for the storks, he aimed at the spot with his gun and did not miss the, his shot, for it pierced through the ribs of the elder of the two girls. The younger, helpless in her grief, bent over her sister's body. The father, not dreaming of what he was about, and astonished to find that he, his having shot one of the storks did not make the other fly away, discharged another shot at the remaining white figure. Lamentable to relate, he hit his second daughter as he had the first. She fell, pierced to the chest, and was laid on the same grassy pillow as her sister. The father, pleased with his success, came up to the rushes to look for his game. But what? No storks? Alas! Not only his two daughters. Filled with consternation, he asked what it all meant. The girls, breathing with difficulty, told him that their resolve had been to show him the crime of taking life, and thus respectfully to cause him to desist therefrom. They expired before they had time to say more. The father was filled with sorrow and remorse. He took the two corpses home on his back, as there was now no help for what was done. He placed them reverently on a wood stack, and there they burnt, 
making smoke to the blowing wind. From that hour, he was a converted man. He built himself a small cell of branches of trees near the village bridge, placing therein the memorial tablets of his two daughters. He performed before them the due religious rites, and became the most pious follower of Buddha. Ah, that was filial piety and very true. I marvel that these girls should throw away their own lives, so that by exterminating the evil seed in their father's conduct in the world, they might guard him from its awful fruit in the world to come. The end. I hope you liked this story. The next story begins in a moment. I will read a story called The Chrysanthemum Show. Yoshi-san and her, his grandmother go to visit the great temple at Shiba. They walk up its steep stairs and arrive at the liqueur threshold. Here they place aside their wooden clogs, throw a few coins into a huge box standing on the floor. It's covered with a wooden grating, so constructed as to prevent pilfering hands afterward removing the coin. Then they pull a thick rope attached to a big brass bell, like an exaggerated sheep bell, hanging from the ceiling, but which gives forth but a feeble, tinkling sound. To ensure God's attention, this is supplemented with three distinct claps of the hands, which are afterward clasped in prayer for a short interval. Two more claps mark the conclusion. Then, resuming their clocks, they clatter down the steep, copper-bound temple steps into the grounds. Here are stalls of innumerable of toys, fruit, fish cakes, birds, tobacco pipes, ironmongery, and rice. And scattered amidst the stalls are tea houses, peep shows, and other places of amusement. Of these, the greatest attraction is the newly opened chrysanthemum show. The chrysanthemums are trained to represent figures. Here is a celebrated warrior, Kado Kiyomasa, by name, who lived about the year 1600, when the eminent Hashiba ruled Japan. Near the end of his reign, Hashiba, wishing to invade China, but being himself unable to command the exp expedition, entrusted the leadership of the fleet and army to Kiyomasa. They embarked, reached Korea, where a fierce battle was fought and victory gained by Kiyomasa. When, however, he returned to Japan, he found Hashiba had died, and the expedition was therefore recalled. Tales of the liberality and generosity of the chief, and how he single-handedly had slain a large and wild tiger with the spear that he represented holding, led to his being at length addressed as a god. His face is modeled in plaster and painted, and the yellow chrysanthemum blossoms may be supposed to look like the gold bosses on the verdant armor. Next, they looked at eccentric varieties of this autumn flower, such as those having the petals longer and more curly than usual. To show off the flowers, every branch was tied to a stick, which caused Yoshi-san to think the bushes looked a little stiff and ugly. Near the warrior was a chrysanthemum-robed lady, Benton, standing in a flowery sailing boat that is supposed to contain a cargo of jewels. Three rabbits farther on appeared to be chatting together. Perhaps the best group of all was a Fukura Kujin, with a white beard and a bald head. He was conversing with two of the grateful waterfowl, so constantly seen in Japanese decorations. He was the god of luck, and has a reputation for liking good cheer. This is suggested by a gourd a usual form of a wine bottle that is suspended to his cane, whilst another gourd contains homilies. He is said to be so tender-hearted that even timid wild fowl were not afraid of him. Not the least amusing part of the show was the figure before Yoshi's grandmother exclaimed, Why, truly, that is clever. Behold, I pray thee, a barbarian lady, and even her child. In truth, 
it was an unconscious caricature of Europeans, although the lady's face had not escaped being made to look slightly Japanese. The child held a toy and had a regular shock head of hair. The frizzed hair of many foreign children appeared very odd to Yoshi-san. He thought their mothers must be very unkind to not take the little western men more often to the barbers. He complacently compared the neatness of his own shaven crown and tiddly, clipped and gummed sidelocks. Being tired of standing, the old grandmother told her grandson they would go and listen to a recital of the storytellers, leaving their wooden shoes in the pigeonhole for that purpose. They joined an attentive throng of some twenty listeners, seated on mats in a dimly lighted room. Yoshi could not make out all the tale teller said, but he liked to watch him toy with his fan as he introduced his listeners to the characters of his story. Then the storyteller would hold his fan like a rod of command, whilst he kept his audience in rapt attention. Then sometimes, amidst the laughter of those present, he would raise his voice to a shrill whine, and would emphasize the joke by a sharp tap on the table with his fan. After they had listened to one tale, Yoshi-san was sleepy, so they went and bargained with the man outside, who had a carriage like a small gig with shafts, called a jinrikisha. He ran after them to say he consented to wheel them home, the two and a half miles for five cents. The end. I hope you like this story. The next story begins in a moment. I will read a story called The Filial Girl. A girl once lived in the province of Echigo, who from her earliest years tended her parents with all filial piety. Her mother, when after a long illness she lay at the point of death, took out a mirror that she had had for many years concealed, and giving it to her daughter spoke thus, When I have ceased to exist, take this mirror, in thy hand, night and morning, and looking at it, fancy that tis thou I ceased. These last words she expired, and the girl, full of grief and faithful to her mother's commands, used to take out the mirror night and morning, and gazing in it, she saw there in a face like to the face of her mother. Delighted thereat, for the village was situated in a remote country district among the mountains, and a mirror was a thing the girl had never heard of. She daily worshipped her reflected face. She bowed be before it till her forehead touched the map, as if this image had been, in very truth, her mother's own self. Her father, one day, astonished to see her thus occupied, inquired the reason, which she directly told him. But he burst out laughing and exclaimed, why, tis only thine own face, so like thy mother's, that is reflected. It is not your mother at all. This revelation distressed the girl, yet she replied, Even if the face be not my mother's, it is the face of one who belonged to my mother, and therefore my respectfully saluting it twice every day is the same as respectfully saluting herself. And so, she continued to worship the mirror more and more, while tending to her father with all filial piety. At least so the story goes. For even today, as great poverty and ignorance prevail in some parts of Echigo, the peasantry know as of little mirrors, as did this little girl. The End I hope you liked this story. Thank you for listening to Story Station. We are adding stories as frequently as possible, so check back often. We would love to hear your feedback and any questions you may have. Thank you.